All right. Um, let's let's get rolling um, because we want to really showcase these students and their amazing work. Um, so I will kick us off. Welcome you again um, to our Old West Society Trout Gallery Tour. For those of you I haven't met, my name is Christy Brandt and I'm the college's director of planned giving. I'm joined uh, by my advancement colleagues, Kate Hoffman and Sam Kramer. So you may have heard or will hear from us in terms of follow-up if you have any questions after the event. And of course, we have the very talented Trout Gallery staff here. Um, you'll meet them and the students in just a minute. Again, if you haven't already, uh, please put your name and your class year or your Dickinson affiliation in the chat so that we know who's here and everyone else can see who's attending. Um, each year, this is one program that we like to do each year to hold a couple of special educational programs for our Old West Society members and our Mermaid Society members. You are among the college's most loyal donors, and we want to give you that unique opportunity to really see the dedication and the academic achievement and the talent that are part of our Dickinson experience every day. I know that seeing this artwork from your computer screen is really an imperfect substitute for viewing it in person, but we are so hopeful that you'll enjoy the program. You'll gain some additional insight from these students who have worked so hard uh, for months and months under just the strangest of circumstances um, to put these shows together. They are incredibly talented. I've enjoyed in uh, looking at their work and talking with them just a little bit over these last few weeks. And I, I really want to extend our thanks to our students as well for taking their time during this last week of class um, to talk with us today. So at this time, I'm going to turn everything over uh, to Heather Flaherty, the Curator of Education at the Trout Gallery. Heather, thank you so much for you and your team putting this together. Um, please, please kick us off. All right, thank you so much, Christy. Um, and for those of you uh, as alumni, I should probably mention that Christy and I actually went to undergraduate college together. We went to the same small liberal arts college. Um, and then when she started at Dickinson, we sat across a regular monthly meeting table from each other for a year before we realized that who we were and that we knew each other and that in fact we had acted in numerous plays together at, in our undergraduate experience. So um, this is a, I feel like we're coming full circle here doing an event together. Um, so I am Heather Flaherty. I'm the Curator of Education at the Trout Gallery, which is a fancy way of saying that I'm in charge of everything we do that has to do with teaching and learning. And so today we are really excited because we're gonna be able to share with you two exhibitions that are really the highlight of our year every year at the Trout Gallery. And those are the two exhibitions that our students are most involved in. Um, so I am sitting, standing in this virtual gallery. This is actually a shot from the Senior Studio Art Exhibition titled Remnant. Um, and we have three students on our Zoom call today that are going to be talking to you about their work in this exhibition. Um, this exhibition happens every year and it's the capstone experience for senior studio art majors at Dickinson. They work all year on substantive projects. Um, there is a show halfway through the year of their works in progress. And the idea is that they are making gains all year. And so the faculty really want to see that they have made a huge change even from their works in progress to the end of the year. Um, so the idea is a really focused, intensive experience of, of art making, of art criticism, um, evaluation, and the culmination of all this work is the show that goes up in the Trout Gallery. And so we're really excited for students to share with you their work today and talk to you about their process and the ideas that went into the incredible exhibition that, that is sitting behind me right now. Um, the second show we're going to be talking to you about today is the capstone experience for senior art history majors at Dickinson College. And this happens also every year, and it is supervised by a faculty member in the Department of Art and Art History. Um, this year, it happened to be the director of the Trout Gallery, Philip Ehrenfeit, who is also a professor in that department. 
And these students tackled a huge and unwieldy topic this year, and they did an amazing job bringing order, focus, and, and a real sense of um, deep understanding of the history of photography to their work. They actually combed archives um, here at Dickinson College. There are a lot of photographs in the show that feature Dickinson's campus, um, Dickinson's history throughout time. Um, we uncovered in our research, for instance, um, an entire um, album that was created by one of the um, one of the he started as a janitor and then he became head of one of the fraternities and he actually kept track of the fraternity actions over a number of years um, and he is his photograph and the camera which was a brownie camera at the time that he took these pictures in is part of our exhibition so we learned a lot about Dickinson College and about how so experiences of students at Dickinson have changed throughout the ages. Um, one of my favorite images is of a student's personal photo album from his years at Dickinson, and he shows his first date. And, you know, these, these pictures, he calls his, his date um, his, own, his own first mermaid. Um, so it's his first date at Dickinson College. And so this show has been sort of fantastic to, to put together. We've learned so much about the history of the college and Carlisle along the way. Um, so it's called In Light of the Past, uh, and it features photographs primarily from the Trout Collection, special collections here on campus, and then also the Cumberland County Historical Society, um, which is where we got a lot of great photographs of life in and around Carlisle through the ages. And again, we have three students who curated this show. Um, these are students, they wrote essays, they produce a catalog. There's also a catalog produced for the Studio Art Show. Um, and these essays are, are really tackled big topics, um, heavy topics, um, and they explore the ways in which photography um, is an art form that really has impacted how we see and understand our personal identities, our place in the world, um, and how we process a global society in different cultures. And so it's a, it's a really exciting experience as well. As you might imagine, this year has been a little strange for these students. Um, making art during COVID when I'd say at least half of our students were at home trying to improvise studio spaces was definitely a challenge. And what we see is that students rose to this challenge and started experimenting in ways that they hadn't before. Um, just behind me here is the work of one of our studio art students, Jeremy Yu. Um, Jeremy was working from abroad all semester. Um, and the other thing about Jeremy is Jeremy was working um, on her iPad. So one of the things students had to do was explore media that they could do at home. As you might imagine, not many parents were excited about oil painting happening in their living room something about the smell, something about the messiness. Um, so what we found were students experimented in different media. They did a lot of digital work. Um, they worked with things like collage. Um, they uh, started working with color pencils, markers, charcoals, sort of things that they could actually do at home. Um, and this actually led their art in all different kinds of new directions. They had to learn new media. And then we also had to figure out how to send that art back to Dickinson for the exhibition, right? So if you're working in China and you want your work to be on exhibit, how's it going to get here? So clearly you're probably not going to be making 10 by 15 paintings or, you know, 200 pound sculptures. Um, and so the, those kinds of challenges were part of our year. And I think as you'll see, these students responded in amazing ways. Um, for our art history students, they were researching objects they couldn't actually see in person which is sort of the cardinal rule of art history, that, that that physical object is crucially important to your ability to understand how it was meant to be seen, viewed, used in its original context. And so um, there was a lot of photography, Zoom work, videos, um, 
We had one student, Ana Elena Karlova, who's here on our call today, who was on campus all year. Um, so she worked in the archives um, alongside Professor Aaron Fight. Don't worry, distanced with masks, alternating shifts, all the sort of COVID protocol. Um, and so she she sort of was the one that came closest to having somewhat of a of a normal experience, but she was also mostly all alone by herself at Dickinson. So her year was hardly normal either. Um, so the uh, for the second semester, Jackson Rhodes, who's here on the call, was on campus. Um, so he was able to sort of work on campus. Um, and so that was certainly a change um, in terms of how the students were able to sort of see the works. Um, and so some of these students have actually visited the gallery and seen their works up in their exhibitions. Others have not. Um, they have seen videos and photographs. And so um, it's it's been a really different year in terms of everything that we've done. But one of the things that we found fascinating, and this came up last night at our, when we had the senior studio art opening, is the ways in which students have creatively used digital media to stay connected and to create that sense of a peer group that can respond to and comment on your work. And one of the things that Professor Anthony Servino, who worked with the senior studio art students said, is that they kept a constant Instagram feed of what they were were working on and that way they could they couldn't walk by the studio spaces that we have at Dickinson but they could look at each other's Instagram feeds throughout the semester and keep tabs on what people were doing and the direction their work was was headed in and one of the skills students learned this semester in studio art that has never been a huge focus of the program was documenting their work and their processes and writing about it intensively and so you know there were some skills that didn't get as developed but there was a whole nother set that became crucially important. Um, so it's been exciting. For those of you that um, knew the space of the Trout Gallery back when it was a swimming pool, um, because of course the Weiss building was a gymnasium at one point, we like to joke that you can still smell chlorine when you're walking around through the gallery space at Dickinson. Um, the Trout Gallery now has a collection of almost 10,000 works of art in our two vaults in the building. And we have be typically between six Six and eight exhibitions a year and students at Dickinson participate in every aspect of museum life. We have between 11 and 18 students that work at the Trout Gallery every year doing everything from social media to software development for new technologies like our app which there are audio tours associated with the studio art exhibition if you want to see that. We have students that teach foreign language programs at the Trout Gallery. We offer programs in Spanish, French, Italian, German, Arabic, Chinese, and Japanese. And students at Dickinson give those programs in the target language. Um, we also are really excited about the ways in which our following on campus has grown. We have a museum ambassador program where Dickinson students from every major are visiting, talking about, and engaging with our material. We typically have between 25 and 35 museum ambassadors a year. Um, and the ways in which students from different disciplines bring new insights into how we talk about and look at art um, has been wonderful. And I will say one of the exciting things about how many interdisciplinary students we have involved with the Trout is that they drag their professors in. So we have professors and faculty from disciplines like physics and environmental studies and chemistry, and it's their students who are saying, you know, we're talking about this in class, we really should go to the Trout Gallery because they have this work of art that deals with exactly these themes, but from a totally different perspective. And so it's students at Dickinson who are bringing faculty and their classes into the door and really enriching that kind of interdisciplinary education that is so valued at Dickinson. Um, so it's been great. And I should say a lot of our students work with the community. We have a robust outreach program. Um, we have programs for K through 12 school groups that Dickinson students help to teach and develop. Um, we have regular public tours. We do language programs for kids in the community. 
in the space and also for recent immigrants to the area who are learning language. And Dickinson students are involved in sort of every aspect of what we do in terms of civic engagement and outreach within the community. Um, so um, the Trout Gallery is a really wonderful place to be. Um, these days. And when you're on campus, I encourage you to visit, um, go on one of our public tours that are led by our talented Dickinson students. Um, because I think, you know, for me, the, my absolute favorite part of my job is watching Dickinson students grow and flourish as they gain more leadership responsibility at the Trout, and they are the public face of the museum. So that is all by way of introduction. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Um, I want to turn our time over to these talented students who have worked really hard this year and are excited to share with you everything they've accomplished. So Bianca, I'll, and I should say my colleague Bianca Martucci Fink is on this call. You can see her there. She is the communications and events coordinator at the Trout Gallery, and she will be sort of spearheading the technical aspects of what we're doing today, making sure all the images are working for students. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to her now. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be on this call with you this morning. Um, our first student is Anna Elena Karlova. And I will just share this presentation and send things off to Anna Elena. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, Bianca. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Anna Elena, and I'm a double major in economics and art history. And for the senior art history show, I worked on snapshots. Um, so snapshots emerged in the late 19th century um, because of a lot of technological developments in photography, such as better lenses, roll film, higher photosensitivity, um, and shorter processing time. Um, next slide, please. Um, snapshots contain humor and imperfections, just like the one you see on the screen. Um, and the snapshot's charm is really in its accidental qualities produced by the photographer's lack of training. So during the fall semester, like Heather mentioned, I was on campus. So I was able to select snapshots from Dickinson's archives and special collections for the show. It was really great to work with the physical objects. Um, and the snapshot section of the show contains both loose snapshots and snapshots placed in photo albums. So while I was doing research on snapshots, uh, I came across a book dedicated to Kodak advertisements. Um, and I really became interested in the advertising campaign that included the Kodak girl. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so you can see her in the image in front of you. She's wearing her typical blue and white striped dress. Um, in my essay titled, The Kodak Girl, A Snapshot of Women's Role in Photography, I examine Kodak girl advertisements and snapshots from this era in which women are either behind or in front of the camera lens. So the Kodak girl reflects the growing freedom of women in the early 20th century. Although George Eastman, who is the founder of Kodak, did not primarily intend to uplift women's voices in photography, but rather to increase profits through these advertisements, a side effect of the company's marketing efforts was placing women in the center of photography. Next slide, please. These women embrace their newly acquired independence to explore nature, to travel, or like the images in front of you suggest, to drive. The image of the independent woman photographer in Kodak advertisements shaped perceptions of womanhood, um, shaped perceptions of womanhood as is suggested by snapshots. For example, the one you see in front of you with the three women sitting on a car bumper. So the Kodak Girl advertising campaign declined in popularity during the period between World War I and World War II and officially ended in the 1970s. Um, but snapshots continue to grow in popularity. Um, and today we experience them mainly through our cell phone cameras. Um, so that was a very brief overview of my research um, and what I worked on for the Senior Art History Show. Um, so thank you so much for your time. All right, Tenson, do you want to go ahead next? 
Yeah, sorry, I was ready to be called on. <laughs> Hi, everyone, I'm Tenzin. Um, so I'm a senior art history major and um, my section of the show focused on art photography. So you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so when considering art photography, I became really interested in the aesthetic of street photography. Um, I myself have done some photography at Dickinson and it's a style that I've gravitated towards. So I was curious um, about that time period in like the 50s and 60s. Um, as I was starting to do my research, I noticed a lot of intersection with um, beat literature. And at the time, I was also taking English class in um, like just beat literature, um, specifically Jack Kerouac. And that led the investigation of my research towards the Americans. Um, next slide, please. So the Americans was a book that was, um, well, the introduction was written by Jack Kerouac and the photos were taken by Robert Frank. Um, and in my essay titled for Photograph Photographic Poetry, Robert Frank and Jack Kerouac's The Americans, I analyzed Jack Kerouac's introduction and Frank's photographs against beat philosophy and discussed similarities found among the three. Um, in my essay, I aim to provide a comprehensive discussion of those three things, and I, I hope it was successful. <laughs> I enjoyed writing it, and it was lots of fun to research. Um, but so the book originally came into being through a fellowship which Frank received from the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. Um, the project in its finished version had 83 images, uh, which is only a fraction of what Robert Frank took. He took something like 27,000. So lots of photos which captured America. And the images Frank captured focus on authenticity um, and he ultimately produced a series which I think really resonates as personal, poetic and real. Um, Frank's images were a stark contrast to the day's existing photo book standard, which was done by Edward Steichen. Um, sorry, you can skip forward <laughs> to the next slide. These are just examples of some of the photos that are in Frank's book. Um, but Edward Steichen's book, The Family of Man, those were images were a lot more um, canned and it showed humanity as more of like an individual, um, like unified figure. And Frank really sought to find more of the like individual personalities of the country. Um, which is something which beat literature really resonated with. They believed a lot in like freedom of expression um, and like truth of movement. And Frank's images really had that like quick fire snapshot emotion to them. Um, so yeah, that was my research. <laughs> Pass it over to Emma. Hi, sorry. Um, I'm Emma, I am a senior art history and Italian double major, um, and my section of the show was on daguerreotypes. Um, so they're the earliest form of photography, and I wanted to explore something about them that isn't really well known, um, especially, namely, uh, nude photographs. Um, because nude photography is, or sorry, nude art and imagery has been around since the beginning of art, or, and with fertility goddesses and ancient Greek sculptures, um, and the advent of photography in which the individual herself is captured instead of just like an artist's impression of her changed the way that nude images were seen. Um, and without that religious or mythological undertone, a nude woman in a photograph was just an explicit body instead of high art. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so these are a couple examples of <laughs> early um, pornographic and erotic imagery. And an interesting ambiguity in nude daguerreotypes and nude imagery are the terms pornographic versus erotic. Um, and so to define these terms, I used Gloria Steinem's definition, who said that, quote, erotica is rooted in eros or passionate love and thus in the idea of positive choice. Pornography begins with the root porno, meaning prostitution or female captives, thus letting us know that the subject is not mutual love, but domination and violence against women, end quote. So these are a couple examples, as I said, of erotic and um, pornographic imagery. So the one on the left um, is Agostino Caracci's Nymph Puto and Sederino from 1590. Um, this is an example of pornographic, as you can see, it's pretty explicit, um, as is the one on the right, which is Thomas Rowlandson's um, Italian picture dealers humbugging my Lord Anglace. Um, those are both very pornographic, but the one in the middle is erotic. It's Sarah Goodrich's Beauty Revealed, and it is a self-portrait of her breasts. She gave it to a lover that she had, and it shows the mutual affection that she had with this man. Um, and so it kind of changes the meaning of that pornographic image. So you can go to the next slide. Um, 
And so I determined three specific categories of nude daguerreotypes. This is the Etude de Prenne Nature. I'm sorry, I don't speak French. It's an artistic study. <laughs> um, this was used by artists in place of live models who are expensive to hire. Um, and so it was just a way for artists to use the theme of the, the body to in their art um, in a cheaper way. Um, and then the next slide. This is an art daguerreotype, um, which emulates the style and composition of an old master painting. This is in the image or in the style of Danae, which is an Ovidian story um, in which a woman is visited by Zeus in the form of a golden shower. And then the last one is a pornographic daguerreotype, which is the most ambiguous category because a lot of times artistic studies and art daguerreotypes were so sold for pornographic gratification. Um, the audience for these pornographic images were generally upper class men, um, as daguerreotypes were expensive to produce, and new daguerreotypes were even more expensive as heavy censorship laws, excuse me, <laughs> kept new daguerreotype operations underground. Um, while these new daguerreotypes soon became obsolete with the rise of negative base photography, which could more readily and more cheaply supply the demand for these imageries, uh, the new daguerreotype marks the advent of the use of the nude in photography, as well as the beginning of the pornographic trade and interest, in earnest, I'm sorry. Regardless of intent, though, um, in these new daguerreotypes, it's possible to see the influences of classical and contemporary art, and it endeavors to connect the new technology to the long, beautiful history of art and the nude in art. Thank you. Jackson? Yeah, thanks. Hi, everybody. So my name is Jackson Rhodes. I'm a senior art history major and oh, no, let's see, uh, with a Chinese minor. And my focus was photo books and albums. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so as a focus, photo books and photo albums is remarkably unfocused in that it's such a wide category of things to research, like um, any type of image next to text or image placed for categorization is grouped under this. So the first half of our semester was you know, roughly um, researching all the different things that we needed to know for our focuses. And in class, we would learn about uh, the general history of photography. And a lot of my research was just understanding the nature of different types of photo albums um, I've included a picture here of a woman looking at a stereograph, which is two images placed next to each other, which when looking through a device appears three dimensional. And those were popularized in the later half of the 19th century. And those in the center of that image is a cabinet, which is where those are placed and organized. And around the same time, historically, cabinet cards are becoming popular. Um, and these are organized completely differently in these sheathed, um, empty kind of places for you to place whatever images you take personally. So um, you can go to the next slide. So in the second half of the semester, we were really implementing all of that research into the exhibition and the design of how it would look. And I've included an image of the exhibition being put together. And because a lot of my work was physical books, they have to be put in glass boxes so that you can see the object. And uh, we had to decide which pages of the book we would have visible. Um, and because photo albums and books are so varied, um, a lot of the things that we have exhibited are from different periods of time, very early on to more recently. And um, I'm especially excited about the inclusion of my my work individually, which was on the Massacre of Milai article in Life on December 5th, uh, 1969, which introduced me to a lot of war photography research and learning more about how magazines came to be prominent in American society. So, yeah, thank you. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for the moment. Um, thank you, art history seniors, for your presentations. Now we are going to open it up to questions for our art history students before we move on to the studio show. Um, there are lots of different ways you can ask your question. 
You can type your question in the chat and I can read it. You can raise your hand with the raise hand function and I can call on you, or you can just feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask a question to one of the seniors. I would like to know which professors were most influential in helping you with your photographic um, research. So yeah. our professor for the class is uh, Phil Ehrenfeit, who's also the director of the Trout Gallery. And because we were all digital, um, he went through the effort of making individual videos of each of the objects so that we could you know, quote unquote, interact with them and, um, you know, try and ascertain a physicality while we were all virtual. So he was, you know, the main powerhouse behind getting the exhibition completed. Were most of the photographs in the Trout Gallery um, archives or other resources? Um, it kind of depended on which section. Um, for mine personally, because daguerreotypes are so basically artifacts, um, they were mostly from the archives, but I know Tenzin section, um, hers were mostly from the Trout Gallery's own personal collection. So it kind of just depended. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat from Nancy and John. Um, do the students think there is still a role for wet dark rooms or have digital tools completely replaced it? I still love to be in the dark room. So I definitely think that there's space for that. Um, there's something so special about like having the image come to you sort of through the film. Um, and we've talked about this in our class and in our lectures about the idea of like making art and um, with these more digital formats, like is this digital form of imagery still considered art? Um, and then even more so when you get into the like, idea of projections or um, I don't know, maybe like my classmates want to chime in as well, but I personally still love the dark room. I'd like to ask a question of the student who showed us the Kodak girl. Can I be heard? Yep, we hear you. Thank you. My my dad actually worked for Kodak. I grew up in Rochester in New York, and he worked for Kodak his entire life um, until his retirement. I thought it was an interesting paradox to see that the Kodak girl is in fact a painting. Uh, and I wonder at what point Kodak began to use its photography as advertising. And uh, of course they had to deal with the issue of black and white versus color in the in the early years before Kodachrome came on the scene. But, but I'd just like to know a little bit more, please, about Kodak advertising and uh, what replaced the Kodak girl, for example, as a focus of advertising. Um, yeah, so the Kodak girl, you're right. It was mostly illustrations, although she was promoting photography. The advertisement th themselves were illustrations. Um, and I really thought about this. And the reason why I think this is, is because illustrations provide more freedom on what exactly is shown. So the artist has more freedom um, to portray um, the Kodak girl in whatever way he wants. Whereas a photograph, there is not, there is still some room for manipulation um, and also showing something that you want, but illustrations have more freedom in terms of that. And then after the Kodak Girl, um, during the time of the Kodak Girl, she really promoted uh, women's freedom uh, and independence. And she was always shown alone, traveling, driving and so on. Um, but afterwards, um, the campaign died um, and it was mostly, um, mostly Kodak focused on family scenes um, and scenes with children. Um, so there was more of a move to the domestic realm um, and really the Kodak girl did not have any place in that because she was more about independence and freedom. Thank you. I, I have a question uh, about the Robert Frank uh, work. The, the great thing about the Americans was actually the 
contact sheets that Frank worked from. And I'm curious to know whether you were able to see or find some of the contact sheets where he chose the negatives that he would focus in on to actually include in the work. Yes, um, yeah, so I was. I was really fortunate because MoMA um, did a large exhibition of Frank's work right. a few years ago. Yeah. yeah, and unfortunately I wasn't able to see it in person, but um, there was like all their information is online. So they had like images of all the contact sheets and everything. So I was able to look at it. Um, and I used the contact sheets as part of like talking about his artistic process and comparing that um, to the beats. So, and also like Jackson mentioned earlier, um, Professor Aaron Fright was incredibly helpful in like calling old friends that he knew and <laughs> trying to find all these different ways for us to be um, more involved in our projects. Right, well, what, one of the great things of working, if you're actually in an archive, and I, I've had the good fortune to spend time with ICP's archive. When you're looking at, at the actual works, you discover other works. So how did you keep that spirit? How did all of you keep that spirit of accidental discovery going while you were doing your uh, research and developing your ideas? Um, one thing that Professor Ehrenfeit was really great about was sending us books. Um, as we were home, we didn't really have access to libraries or anything. Um, and so I ended up finding my research topic through just reading a ton of books that Ehrenfeit had sent us. Um, and so that was pretty much the only way that I was able to kind of branch off into new ideas and new topics. Um, so yeah, it really. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And adding on to that, he had weekly meetings with each of us. So we were just like an hour conversation that we would have with him. Um, and then he, at least for me, at the end of my meetings, I would leave sometimes more confused because he just had so many ideas of places I could like continue or jot off to. Um, so that was really helpful. Great. Thank you. Any other questions before we move on to our studio students? I'd just like to say hi to Jackson Rhodes, who uh, sit behind in the Dickinson College Orchestra in the good times. I sit with my bassoon and he's a wonderful string player and it's very nice to see him again. I wish him well as he graduates from Dickinson, thank you. Thanks so much, Jim. It's good to see you again. Awesome. Well, I can transition to our studio students. Zoom will move on. And we'll start with Grayson Bird. All right, hi everyone. Yes, my name is Grayson Bird. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I can introduce my work this year, which has been a series of oil paintings called Bittersweet. And this year I was exploring how women experience physical and emotional intimacy with both themselves and others. And so I started out thinking that I was going to work with self-portraits, and then I decided I want to speak more generally to female experiences. So I was drawing on my own experiences with both toxic and healthy relationships with friends, families, and partners, at, and the ambiguity that exists in those relationships. And so one aspect of this that I explored um, was identity and how women define themselves and how they're viewed by other people. And my paintings don't normally show multiple figures, but this is an example of one that does, and it's called Reflections. And it speaks to female identity. And one inspiration that I drew on was classical imagery and poses, which can kind of be seen in the hands of these figures and the almost religious undertones in their poses. 
And if we can go to the next slide. Um, something else that I worked with was this idea of transparency. And to kind of hint at interactions that are maybe fading over time or exist in these women's memory. And so in many of these paintings, there are these hands or limbs or shadows that are interacting with the women that are kind of ghostly and transparent and can be read as both positive or negative, depending on how you come to the painting and maybe what your own relationships have looked like. So for example, on the piece on the right, you could view the hands reaching out towards the woman as either giving her something or taking away, or you could view the hand on her back as pushing her or supporting her. And so these are all moments of vulnerability, but we don't have the full story. The next slide will show um, kind of the pastel colors that I like to use. I found that these colors are comfortable and comforting to me, and they have the ability to draw people in, but then might depict something that's surprising. And these colors also separate these paintings from reality a bit and maybe place them in a dream world or in someone's memory. And the next slides will also show that some pieces do address themes such as sexual violence and the conflicting emotions of those experiences, um, such as the top painting. And I like to put these shadows or ghostly limbs of other figures, but we can't see the other figure's identity or their intentions, only the, the woman's. And so in these paintings, I'm also thinking about how I address the tradition of female nude portraiture in the art historical canon, because traditionally nude female portraiture would be um, a woman who's unaware of the viewer and meant to be looked at as a sexual object for usually the male viewer's pleasure. And so these women are, I like to think of them as they're nude, but they're not naked. They're not meant to be looked at in a sexual way. Um, and in terms of their gaze, they're not looking directly at the viewer, but they are looking at the figures that they're interacting with. So they do still have a kind of agency and power. And then that puts the viewer in a strange position of almost voyeurism as they're looking in on these private moments. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a glimpse of what I was looking at with these pieces. Thank you. All right, Ernest. Hello everyone, my name is Ernest NTA. I'm a studio arts and political science major. Um, so my series that I created was um, titled uh, Prizes. I wanted to touch on and speak on the countless experiences that uh, people of the African diaspora are presented with um, in predominantly white or Western societies. Um, and to get around some of the COVID restrictions, I decided to use myself as the, as the subject matter. Um, I, this allowed me to not only be comfortable in front of the camera, uh, but also um, uh, as well with different processes. And this, um, what you're looking at right now was more of what I was working on last semester. So I was dealing with things like um, patri patriotism, um, oh, um, things like grief, um, fetishism, and also talking um, tokenism and um, generational work, things like that. Um, you can go to the next slide. And during the first half of the semester, I was dealing more with um, things that are um, topics or obstacles that are um, brought by to uh, outer societies. So I was dealing th uh, about uh, especially with the first image on the left, which is the orange saturation one. I was dealing with the idea of professionalism in society. Um, there are much more higher conse consequences for black individuals to make more mis uh, to make mistakes and grow from that. And in this image, I wanted to kind of like emulate that. I was drawing from um, Andres Serrano's Piss Christ. Uh, I showed the figure's hands spread out and in motion, and it feels like they're uh, evaporating. Um, and the warm um, um, colors also hones that on that, and it almost feels like it's a sacrificial uh, ritual taking place um, where a person trying to find themselves will be, will cause them um, more, will cause them in the process of doing that. And then the second image was dealing with uh, resiliency, um, despite all the obstacles. And the next image was dealing with now having only us as the only community. That, um, in a society, in um, Western society, in this image. 
And then the this series that I worked on was dealing with trauma or trauma porn. Um, I wanted to investigate uh, and talk about how the media um, like usually ch choose to show graphics um, uh, for just for the sole purpose of shock value um, and disregard how, how um, Black people will react or um, deal with such exposure like that. Um, black people, individuals are not given time to heal um, due to this overexposure, um, overexposure or trauma. And hence why in this image, I wanted to emulate that feeling that black people feel when it's supposed to things like that. Um, they feel entrapped and intentionally, and I intentionally use the shadows uh, of the bars to represent a sense of imprisonment and, and the light with which, and the light that I used in there to kind of show them being under attack and ultimately they feel like they're in distress. Uh, and then they can get out of the space that they're trapped in there. Um, and you can go to the next slide. And this you know, was also going back to the same uh, topic around trauma, um, but in this aspect, it was more in um, like in reality, in real life, where once you're out in society uh, or on the street and you see the presence of, um, let's say, a red and blue, um, red or blue um, light, which is usually associated with police, or when you see police cars, um, some people will feel safe, a good, diff different group of people will, safe, will feel safe, but other people will be, be more of a, like a reality check for them where they're not sure what, like, if, where, what they're approaching or where um, they're going would be, um, will cost them their life since it might be suspected as the person they're looking for. Next image. And then this one, this series, I was dealing with more about identity and discovery, um, where um, I wanted to create a work um, on on the idea of Black queer identity. Um, and so I played in this series, I played around with mirrors to uh, to allude to the notions of reflection. Um, everyone uses mirrors to take a look at themselves, uh, at their at their appearance and how they present or look like. And I know I knew that gender identity is also a performance. And I, um, in a bigger society, you're allowed to perform a certain way to be accepted, while in the black community, you're also allowed to perform in a certain way to also be accepted as a black queer person. Um, and in this first image, the person that I choose, uh, which is the, me as a subject matter, they're putting on a shoes, which is um, a symbol of a queer, queer identity or queerism, uh, where they look into the mirror and question themselves if they should be going through with it or it's just missed both the identity as a black person and also a queer um, person. And the second image is where they put on their shoes and reflect and like look at themselves and um, like if they, they look at themselves and um, question again that if they should go through with it since they're not sure what, um, what wants to step outside, what would people react to it or how they would um, deal with that. Um, and then the last image was them just Stepping out, to, uh, out into, into society uh, where there is a mirror um, presence representing um, society, just looking like um, discreetly looking at them, um, where they're not sure um, again that if walking um, outside, being comfortable in their identity will cost them their life, which is uh, why the title might be my last night, where they are not sure that um, this will like being brave and being um, like firm in their identity will be the last time that it will uh, actually be able to practice that. Yeah. Thank you. Clara. Hi, I'm Clara Roth. Um, I'm a studio art and environmental uh, science double major. Um, but photography has been a really important part of my career at Dickinson. Um, so that's why I included on this slide pictures of me on a couple of photography projects that I was able to do, um, thanks to Dickinson. Um, next slide, please. So this year I began by continuing with photography um, and I focused on documenting the divisive 2020 election. Um, I really wanted to explore how people form their belief systems and how um, please. So I took photos at several events, one of which was a rally to count every vote. And then another was the day that Biden was um, announced president elect in Philadelphia and the response in the city. Um, next slide, please. 
Uh, also in this project, I began to experiment more with collage. I really liked the idea of combining two different images to create an entirely new one. Um, so yeah, here I combined an uh, image of American flag with um, a like doodle or drawing from that I made. Uh, next slide, please. This is another example of a digital collage that I made. Um, this one specifically is focusing on activism um, among youth. The next slide. Then I started to um, experiment more with like creating a space entirely. So this is po images pulled from like just stock images and then some of my own um, and used to, to create a new space. Uh, next slide. Then when the second, the spring semester started, I started thinking more about um, thoughts and memory and I wanted to try and find ways to represent that and so I used my um, images from my camera roll um, and sort of synthesized them together in different ways digitally to try and represent um, what it's like in my brain I guess. Uh, next slide. Then I began um, what ultimately became my, the final product from my seminar. Um, and I printed out a bunch of photos that I've taken over the past four years of my college career and began cutting and pasting them together to create new scenes. Um, so yeah, so this is one of the first collages I made. Next slide, please. So here, this is just kind of showing how, um, I guess, what my process looked like a bit. So the image on the left is from Iceland and then the image on the right is from Colorado, two very different landscapes. Um, and then on the next slide, you can see how I synthesized them together to create an entirely new space. Um, next slide. Yeah, so with my art, I wanted to play with um, combining spaces and blurring the lines between my own experiences and memories. Next slide, please. Um, and so things that I focused on were, yeah, combining urban and rural, um, looking at color, um, shape and line and playing with absence and presence um, and trying to find unique ways to fill in different spaces. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, images came from all different experiences over the past four years. So here in the bottom is part of the Klein Athletic Center on campus, and then surrounding it, the image with the shoes is from the Dickinson Mini Mosaic to Rwanda. Um, next slide. Yeah, so this is, I guess, kind of just to give you a better idea of what individual collages look like. Um, in the Trout Gallery on display, they're all, all together on a wall in a grid, kind of referencing again the camera roll. But um, yeah, there's 20 images, so I didn't want to go through all of them. Um, next slide, please. So this is the last of the ones that I decided to include in the PowerPoint. Thank you. Thank you all for your presentations as well. And now we will open it up to um, questions for our studio students. Again, um, I can read questions from the chat or just feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. I'm impressed by the quality of work throughout all the presentations. Studio art has definitely gotten better since I was at Dickinson. <laughs> so I have a question uh, for the students. Obviously, um, the work that you've put forward is very personal, um, touches on some really personal and most likely difficult um, situations that you've had to experience in your lifetimes. And 
I am really impressed with the way you're able to talk about that in a setting like this. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how you became comfortable with that. Is that something, obviously the art is an expression of yourself, but being able to express it artistically and being able to talk about it is, is not necessarily the same thing. So um, can, you, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, I mean, I guess it's something that definitely takes practice. We've had all year um, <laughs> practicing talking about our art, um, both with our peers and professors and then also in larger settings. But um, yeah, I think practice makes, <laughs> makes perfect in this sense, but then it's also tricky to find, yeah, a balance of how much you're willing to share um, to give per like, perspective or insight into your art versus respecting your own privacy. But yeah, that's that's my answer. Yeah, and I think going off of what Clara said, like we had a pretty small seminar, it was six people. And so we really got to like know each other well and like critique is a very like vulnerable process, I guess, but we all became comfortable with like sharing our work with each other first before we like Put it into the gallery. Um, so that was like kind of a gradual shift, I guess. Um, and like even within my own work, like I mentioned how, you know, I started out thinking about self-portraits, but I think um, as I'm, I don't really think of them as self-portraits. So that kind of helps me not make them maybe so personal to me. And I, you know, hope to capture things that a lot of people can relate to, even if it's like maybe a difficult experience. I think that's something that could be really powerful about art that kind of pushed me to make more vulnerable work. And I'm sure my classmates could agree with that. I'm wondering if one of you, yeah, I just, well, this may come up Ernest, but I'm wondering if one of you could talk about how the title also relates to, to Christy's question. Uh, so I was gonna say, oh, sorry. I was gonna say that uh, to add on to what um, Grayson said, um, like being vulnerable is also part of the um, artistic process um, where you share um, things with people. Um, like it, I think of my art as part of me. Where I, when I put something out, I just want like I'm just putting my emotions into it, and I just wanted to receive feedback or make um, want to know how people feel about it, and if people are having conversation about it. Or if they don't like the art, uh, I feel like I've done my job since if I got communicated something that was uh, provoking enough for them to be re like to get a reaction out of them compared to just showing the work and people not reacting to it just like that. I feel like I haven't been successful if that was the case. I'm um, speaking specifically to your question about the title. Um, yeah, so the grid of images I have on display at the Trout is like titled as one um, artwork and it's called I Can't Quite Remember. And so I guess for me, um, using a title is a good way to kind of like hint at more vulnerable um, parts of the meaning behind my art. I guess if you were just looking at the collages, it could just be a bunch of cool scenes or pretty pictures, but then um, using the title, I can't quite remember. I'm like, I guess I'm trying to hint and get people to start to think more about the themes of like thought and memory and neurodiversity that I was exploring as I was making the art. I also think of the um, titles as more of like a contest. Um, since like when you just put an image out, people might interpret it however they want with no contest. Uh, so I kind of like use my titles as a way to kind of guide them um, to get a clue of what I'm, I'm trying to um, talk about and hopefully they can interpret it using what I've given them, like a few um, information given to them to kind of uh, explore further. If we're thinking of any more questions, I just wanted to point out in the chat that 
Heather has linked a lot of our digital and online resources for the Trout Gallery. So um, if you'd like to explore for further, um, especially with the senior art or studio show, all of the artists um, can be found there on our Trout From Home digital blog site as well. So I just wanted to point out those links um, while we're thinking of more questions. Yeah, I've, I have a question. Uh, thank you so much for having this and having us today. This is really um, fascinating and the students work is um, very impressive. Uh, I was um, thinking, I think you mentioned early, uh, earlier on Heather's, uh, you know, the sort of interdisciplinary nature um, of the work and of course the Dickinson education. Um, the many of the students you mentioned that your double majors or more, um, I heard political science and environmental science and Italian and Chinese. Um, so we'd just love to hear from the students about, you know, sort of your reflections on how your how that's impacting your um, artistic work, how you're sort of leveraging or, you know, leaning into the other uh, areas of study and majors, um, you know, especially particularly uh, in languages and how that influence your work. But um, yeah, just would like to hear your comments about the interdisciplinary nature. So I'm um, a double major with English and studio art. And so I also wrote a senior thesis this year, which was about a graphic novel um, where I looked at um, women's bodies. And I didn't really realize until kind of halfway through my research, like how similar that was to my studio work as well. So being able to do like year long projects that kind of related to each other and spoke to each other um, was really interesting. And um, like, you know, to be able to analyze maybe how women's bodies function in literature and language, and then also um, in like a more visual way, I think definitely influenced each other. Um, so that's like for my work, at least that's my experience. I'm environmental science and studio art. Um, and I guess this came up a little bit last night at the opening, but um, I, for my senior seminar for environmental science, we've been talking about the human place in nature. And so that has um, definitely impacted the way that I went about constructing images. A lot of them are contrasting like natural scenery with um, more urban or industrial landscapes. And so I guess, um, even if I didn't realize it as I was making the pieces, I was definitely thinking about, um, yeah, man-made versus natural and what humans place is in all of these different environments. Um, and I'm a studio arts and political science major. Um, so my work, my, my past work, they have been more about lighthearted subjects because I didn't want to get into any deep um, conversations. Uh, since I talk about my art, it's like an escape for me to dive into my um, utopia world or something like that. Um, but I once I took classes, especially last semester with Catherine Hurd, um, Professor Catherine Hurd, where we're talking about identity and like um, uh, how um, gender can be a performance and things like that. They kind of like gave me the language to um, things I already knew, but then she was able to give me the language um, to actually like tackle and talk about things that I feel like I can talk about, uh, where I feel confident because I have the language and the knowledge to address the things I wanted to address. Do we have any more questions, any more student responses to the previous question? I'm, I'm, I want to echo David and other people's uh, appreciation and thanks, A, that you all have done this amazing work and uh, have been able to do this in, I'm sure, challenging circumstances and, and applaud Dickinson for sharing this with us. It's great. I'd rather be in the Trout Gallery. 
seeing the work in person, but this is a well orchestrated and appreciated uh, temporary substitution. We would too. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's been pretty phenomenal to see what students have been able to produce, the ways in which they've sort of, you know, <laughs> managed to make lemonade out of lemons and um, gone in different directions. And, you know, I've really, you know, a, a number of these students have worked at the Trout Gallery, you know, Ernest, Grayson, Anna Elena, Jackson, um, you know, the, they've all been student assistants at various points. And, you know, to see them grow and change and push themselves in a year where they had a whole lot else going on, um, I think has been really exciting. Yeah, I want to echo everyone's thanks, um, especially to our students. Um, I, you know, as you can tell from my question earlier, I'm blown away by your work um, for all of you. Um, by the amount of effort and ingenuity you have um, you have shown to all of us. Thank you so much for allowing us to talk to you and to understand your work as best we can in this in this crazy environment. Um, and if there aren't any other questions, I'll just say thank you as well to all of our alumni and friends who are participating today. Um, being able to be part of this dialogue in whatever way it happens um, is something that we all want to make sure is part of your Dickinson experience. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. I don't know, Heather, if you have anything else um, you'd like to say on behalf of the Trout Gallery, but we really do appreciate everything that you and Bianca have done to bring this all together for us. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just say before my husband starts weed whacking, <laughs> I'm like gesturing to him out the window, stop. Um, I'll just say that in the chat, I just want to echo what Bianca said earlier. Um, there is an audio tour of the Senior Studio Art Exhibition narrated by Grayson Bird, who is right here on our call, that covers all of the students' works. And I put the link for that in the in the chat here. In addition, the exhibition catalog, um, which shows works um, that uh, some of them aren't even in the show, they're from earlier that the students did, including their own writings about their work. I put the link to that as well. Um, and finally, I put a link to our Trout from Home site. So for those of you um, that don't know about Trout from Home, we launched this when COVID hit. Um, it's a way for us to bring the experience of the Trout Gallery into your homes. There are interviews with our art history and our studio art students. Um, our Dickinson student staff writes, write different columns, Soul Food, which is really about sort of the ways in which art nourishes the soul, object stories, and interviews um, across campus um, that they've done. So, um, and there's a whole tab on the senior studio art experience, senior studio art speak. So I put the link to Trout from Home there as well. And so that will allow you to, to explore even further everything that our students have done, including those students who weren't able to be with us today. Thank you for doing this venue, allowing those of us who would not be able to be back in person on campus to participate in this way. We really appreciate it. Good to see you all. Great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. Thank you.